Hello, uh, good morning. So yes, um, as Mark mentioned, I'm going to sound a note of caution on these strategies that have recently emerged with regards to bundling of content and access. Uh, so my name is Stefan Seele. I'm the CEO of uh, Coliago Consulting and uh, been in the industry for a very long time. And recently, a lot of work is around spectrum and valuing spectrum and uh, capacity for, uh, amongst other things, mobile video. So it has a massive effect on valuation of spectrum. So the work Koleaga is doing is regulatory as well as spectrum. And it's where these two things meet, uh, where we are seeing certain risks with regards to uh, content strategies. Um, one of the things we all operators, especially mobile operators, seem to fret about is that their service offering is essentially undifferentiated. Now, if you have an undifferentiated product, uh, i.e. a commodity, the only difference between one commodity or one within the same commodity group, uh, one seller and another is price. So the only thing you have to compete on is price. That's not good. That's not good for profits. So everybody is desperate to uh, give their service, the excess service, which is kind of generic, some kind of unique sellers, uh, selling point or unique feature that differentiates it in the market. And you know, as the marketing textbook says, that gives you the ability either to charge a higher price or uh, to gain a greater market share and also get other benefits such as increased stickiness and so on. Uh, particularly this sort of thing, when you're looking at um, operators in, in uh, Asia, where price is everything. Let's say Indonesia, for example, the average number of SIMs per person is well above two. Uh, churn is in excess of 100%. Even in relatively advanced market like uh, Malaysia, who are fairly media intensive, average number of SIMs per person, 1.5 and so on. So if you can tie in your customer with some form of unique content, that would be great. Um, the good thing, of course, for operators who are attempting that is that what we have seen is a shift away from viewing linear television. I'm sure you're all familiar with these statistics. There's more and more <coughs> online viewing. I've just picked out this chart. You go to the internet, you do a little search, decline in linear TV, boof, 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 boof. Umpteen charts are coming up. And you can see here, uh, this is uh, sort of uh, 11, 12. So over the years, you see the decline uh, on, a, on, a, on a quarterly basis. This happens to be the US. But you, find, you can find similar stats elsewhere. And it tends to be the younger age groups who are doing this first. I mean, we have a, a generation growing up of people who are not watching TV anymore. And that is very different uh, from the way their parents used time. Um, so some broadband operators have leapt at this. Uh, BT is, of course, the prime example here in the UK, and are making a big bet on exclusive content. So to them, exclusivity is the name of the game. When you watch the advertising, as you can see, the only place to watch uh, UEFA Championship League. So if you want to watch certain matches, you might not really like the BT broadband service for one reason or another. You might not even like BT. But you know what? If you're a football fan, and that is, for many people, the strong thing, isn't it? Watching football, the, the rest sort of in the, in the hierarchy of where uh, they make their choices comes somewhat lower. So you can see quite clearly how the exclusive content becomes the lever by which uh, BT is hoping to attract and retain customers, regardless of any flaws in the actual underlying mobile bro or, or fixed broadband service. Now, in contrast, uh, and I know we have a speaker later on from EE, EE is going down a different route. When they launched their sort of strategy built around 
TV and so on, uh, <coughs> questions popped up. You know, how about you know you don't have any exclusive content? Do you think this is going anywhere and so on? And uh, you know, here here's the response from EE. We strongly believe that the UK has the best uh, free TV content proposition in the world. Uh, da -de -da -de -da. So we don't really see a role for exclusive content. That is very different, isn't it, to BT strategy. And I believe this, this morning uh, the strategy which was outlined by uh, Tim is a little bit similar to that of EE. In other words, customer choice, you know, whatever you want to watch, it's on our platform and so on. So that's a very different angle uh, to come from. Um, and I thought, well, that's fine. Here's, here's, here's what the operators are doing. Let's take a look at what consumers are doing. And what we have seen, and this is again from the US, but perhaps we see similar things here. It's uh, in, in the US, they call it cord cutting. Um, I'm sure you, some of you may have heard of the astronomical cable television bills in the US, like uh, sort of monthly bills of $180. This is not unheard of. Uh, but what we are seeing that an increasing number of people, particularly again young people, are cutting the cord. So they're saying enough of this cable TV subscription. All I want is a pipe. Thank you very much. And then I'm choosing. I'm choosing. I bought a bit of uh, Netflix. I do a bit of Amazon Prime, Hulu. Uh, and yes, other content uh, providers like HBO are going over the top and probably we're going to see more and more of this where content providers are going directly to the consumer uh, and uh, when you read the savings that are available to people who are doing this uh, they're quite substantial the response from the cable industry is to offer smaller packages they call them skinny packages so where you have uh, far fewer content in there uh, to bring down the cost and, and still try to retain the customer. But I mean, it's quite substantial, isn't it? Um, you know, 18.1% of households who have Netflix or Hulu uh, stopped their cable subscriptions. So there you can see the competition. So people are actually, in that sense, unbundling. Aren't so you see that trend in the market. It's, it's clear to see. Uh, now that's the US. Uh, European media markets are quite distinct and every country is quite distinct, uh, particularly in terms of the delivery of media content. Some rely more on satellite, others rely more on cable, others more on digital terrestrial broadcast. So it's, it's a mixed picture in Europe. So I don't think we'll see a, a homogeneous reaction in, in uh, Europe. <coughs> it's going to be slightly different. but. Um, you know, I think this is a very uh, interesting trend. Um, one thing for sure, in Europe, we have also seen that reduction in uh, linear TV consumption. Uh, the big winner, or the winners are, of course, people watching stuff at home over the internet. That's big. But in, in sheer growth, mobile media consumption is really uh, the biggest growth area. Whoops. Now, I thought, what's the view of the king of content? Let's ask him. <laughs> content is not just king. It is the emperor of all things electronic. Now, you think, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? <laughs> um, but I mean, it is a view, and it is somebody, I mean, this is not a stupid man, right? <laughs> so um, it, it, it's, it's interesting. So where is it heading? We see these, these different. Uh, opinions and, and the way things are going. And clearly Sky, uh, a massive player in that area. And here we're really seeing some of the issues with the exclusive strategy. Uh, the bidding for media rights here, the Premier League in the UK, uh, the, with, with uh, BT and uh, Sky battling it out, uh, and billions are being paid out for TV rights. And if you think these, this money is being paid out by uh, telecoms operators who have no real prior media experience, 
this is risky territory and prices are going up. Um, and a cautionary tale uh, back in uh, 2000, uh, I don't know if you, you, you remember the sort of uh, everything was going to be digital, the internet was going to be everything, and Telefonica went out and bought Endemo, a TV production company who bought, brought us delights such as Big Brother for the princely sum of 5.1 billion euro from memory, I think. 5.1 million, 5.1 billion euros. So that's a lot of money. Now, um, fast forward, I think it was five years later or four years later, they realized there wasn't really uh, any money in the sort of walled garden concept that was a term that was used at the time. And they sold it back for three billion to a consortium which included a bank and John Endemol who was uh, one, you know, that is so, so two, two billion worth of shareholder money destroyed. Uh, sort of quite interesting cautionary tale. Of course it's different because then we didn't have uh, we didn't have uh, TV Anywhere apps. We didn't have any of uh, the, the great fiber connections that are around mm -hmm. now. So it could be different this time. The other thing uh, which struck me when comparing the economics of digital content with the economics of telecoms, particularly mobile, uh, the characteristic of digital content is that the incremental or originally creating the content, that's where all the cost is. The cost of distribution, new customers, that's marginal, that's nothing. So the cost of production does not vary with the number of viewers. It's all about getting the maximum number of eyeballs. So I think the, in, in terms of experiencing economies of scale, probably the media industry is the, you know, the prime example. Now having said that, Telecoms, economies of scale also matter because of a lot of the costs are fixed. But in mobile, uh, the increased use of video is actually one of the major cost driver because the cost of adding capacity to mobile network is driving the need to build more sites and to acquire more spectrum. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the prices that are being paid uh, for spectrum. Recently it has gone up very sharply in the US. In the AWS um, 3 auction that ended in, uh, I think, January or February, uh, in excess of $2 per megahertz pop uh, was paid for high band spectrum, which, which, you know, in the 2 dot gigahertz band, that's typical capacity spectrum. So it's all about capacity. And this is really, uh, when we are being asked to value spectrum, some of the operators are looking to introduce content, we have some operators who are fully integrated co companies such as in, in Canada, their players, their own content, their own hockey teams, uh, you know, they, they have got all sorts of things. And if they could bring that to the customer, this would be very interesting. Uh, and of course, they need an awful lot of capacity to perhaps uh, install, uh, reserve a little bit of spectrum for LTE broadcast and so on. So you can see a direct link between spectrum value and pushing uh, digital content uh, to consumers. So, um, but the economics are not the same. Much greater economies of scale here uh, than with the telecoms business. So if the economies are not the same, then in theory you would conclude that, or an economist would conclude, exclusive content has less value to an operator where only the operator's customers can view that content because really you're making the most money if you get the maximum eyeballs. So, and yet it seems to make sense for BT and others to bid and pay for that exclusive content. So there's value on that. What is the value? Um, and I think the value is one that might be potentially be considered as harmful by regulators because it's all about using something that is exclusive, so an, a market that is non-competitive once you acquire it for three years, the UF, UEFA rights, that's not competitive. Broadband, that's competitive. So you're attaching the non-competitive element to the competitive bit, you're tying it 
and through that effectively turning what is a competitive market, the competitive market for broadband into something that is an exclusive market. And this is where the danger lurks uh, from a regulatory perspective. This, by the way, I picked out from Australia. They had a big inquiry there, very hot on net neutrality. They have real competition issues, both in the access and the content world. So any form of exclusivity, I mean, you mentioned exclusivity, and, and that's a red rag to regulators. I mean, they really don't like that stuff. So uh, having said that, there are a number of tests that must be satisfied before regulators might step in and actually do something about it. Uh, first of all, the non-competitive product must be ex uh, important in the context of the competitive product. Uh, then the question of significant market power arises. Is there significant? Who's doing it? That matters. Um, and can an equivalent be obtained elsewhere? Well, clearly with the UEFA football, if you want certain measures, there, there is no substitute in that sense. So uh, the answer there would be, yeah, that's a danger. Um, do consumers benefit or have consumers been harmed? That's a question which is not always that straightforward to answer. Um, and is the predation involved? In other words, are you doing this to drive a competitor out of the market or to limiting a competitor's ability to compete? And clearly, if you are successful with that content, uh, getting exclusive content, you're already big, you get exclusive content, you get bigger, uh, then you can, in the next round of bidding for exclusive content, you get even bigger. Uh, and it is only really the big boys that stand any chance in acquiring this exclusive content right. And this is where uh, you have not perhaps a, a virtuous circus from cir uh, circle from a competitive perspective, but you have a vicious uh, circle. Um, of course, bang on the nail, those of you, some of you might have followed the debate in the US, uh, you know, very much related uh, uh, around the topic of uh, net neutrality. And in February uh, this year, the FCC came out uh, with rulemaking, the so-called bright line rules, no blocking, uh, so you can't block certain content, uh, no throttling, uh, you know, that's really important because that's just a sort of slightly finer form of blocking, really. Uh, and uh, no paid prioritization. This one is uh, interesting. It's kind of odd, because we don't really understand what that means yet. So I think we will, we'll, there's some, of course, there's some clear-cut stuff about it. But what constitute paid prioritization is not entirely clear, because you can look at it from a consumer perspective and also from a uh, provider perspective. For example, if uh, a content provider is paying, uh, let's say, uh, AT&T, so that the people who are viewing the content are not being charged for the traffic, does that fall under paid prioritization or not? Well, you could say, well, no, that's just the equivalent to 0800 free phone, isn't it? Because that's also a form of paid prioritization. You can call a line, you don't pay, it's the receiving party that is paying. So we <coughs> don't really know well, how this will pan out. But the debate is raging, and that's, I quite like that word here. I found that network nepotism. So where, uh, there is a linkage, uh, either be it through ownership or shareholding or some form of agreement between the content provider and the access provider. Uh, you might get into this situation where you get a certain favoritism or nepotism uh, uh, that with, with, the, with the aim to drive out competing content or access providers, uh, and I think pat particularly competing content providers. And as we all know, nepotism isn't a good idea, isn't it? Because that's the opposite of choice, the opposite of the, uh, uh, the free market. So uh, a bit of a dangerous uh, uh, thing to go uh, down that route. Oops, was a bit fast. Um, 
And so I also looked at the BT offer in the UK uh, with regards to the issue of paid prioritization. And you go to the BT site and you, you know, consumer is worried, do I, does this count towards my allowance if I watch TV on the BT uh, line? And the answer is no, BT doesn't count towards broadband usage. Um, is that paid prioritization or not? So what if I'm not really interested? I'm not a football fan. I'm not interested. I don't, I don't care for this Friday fix email which BT sends me every week. Um, so, and, and then I watch other stuff and maybe I'm not on the highest bundle. Maybe there's some kind of a limitation. Will I be, will I have to pay something extra? Will I be, will I be throttled? There was a similar issue in Germany. Uh, Deutsche Telekom used to have limited packages, but as you ran out of your allowance, you could still watch Deutsche Telekom TV. They changed that. They changed that because it was proved not to be sustainable. Uh, the views taken vary a great deal. They vary across the world. That is, the views by the re uh, taken by the regulators vary. They also vary within Europe. So Canada, Chile, Norway, the Netherlands, and Slovenia are examples where regulators tend to take a fairly tough view on this sort of issues. Other countries, less so. And the first blood has been drawn in the Netherlands. Uh, whoops. Either. Uh, well, there we are. So it was a very small amount of blood only 200,000 euros. Vodafone was fined. Why? They had an agreement with HBO and there was some uh, content that was being accessed by Vodafone customers and Vodafone customers did not have to pay for the uh, megabytes that, that were running over the mobile network. And the regulator sent it, stepped in and said all data must be transmitted under the same condition that's the idea behind net neutrality, and that is what we are maintaining now. The EU isn't uh, in entire agreement on that. I mean, that, that sort of, I think, is the most uh, net neutral position you can take. Uh, and yes, a fine has been slapped onto Vodafone. By the way, at the same time, there was also a fine uh, on KPN for uh, a similar sort of uh, infringement. So interesting one. The other issue is the impact of zero rating on wholesale. So if you're having a mobile wholesale business and you are zero rating traffic for your own content, uh, does that amount to margin uh, squeeze for MVNOs? Because you know they have to pay for every megabyte. And that's an issue. And in certain markets actually the MVNO rates are tied to your retail rates or average retail revenues. That's the case, by the way, in Canada. So uh, as you start <coughs> to give away uh, traffic, essentially, you're driving down the wholesale rates, or uh, in this case, uh, you might see uh, an MVNO running to the regulator and shouting, oh, predation, margin squeeze, yada, yada, yada. So again, kind of a risky thing. Uh, and then, how about the content providers themselves? If they see that they fail to get access on equal terms to the eyeballs, they might also <laughs> kick up a fuss and run to the regulators and say, you know, we really can't have this. We must get access to the consumers with our content on equal terms. And that's not a new thing. Um, or do we have any lawyers here in the, in the audience? Well, maybe not. Those of you who remember, do you remember the, 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 the Waltz ice cream and freezer thing and exclusivity? In the, so Waltz ice cream thought, ah, we are very clever. We give all, this was the UK case, we give free freezers to all the news agents in the UK. And you know there isn't much room in a news agent, usually small shops, only one freezer fits in. On, on the condition, you may only put Waltz product into that freezer. So Mars, <coughs> pardon the pun, was frozen out of the market. Uh, and, you know, they went to court and so on, and there was, uh, you know, there's a precedence and so on. And, and clearly this sort of uh, exclusivity couldn't stand because the idea was precisely uh, to, to uh, 
limit access to the market from a uh, competitor. So um, also as uh, telecoms operators are becoming um, media companies in effect or, or look a little bit like broadcasters, particularly, I mean, the LTE folks, are you familiar with EMBMS? That's LTE broadcast. You actually set something aside rather than everybody streaming their content. They can actually watch television over the LTE network. It's quite ironic, really, isn't it, that the mobile operator is saying, oh, we've got to take some spectrum away from the uh, uh, broadcasters because we need it for mobile communication, and then it's being used for broadcast. But that's just uh, an aside. So if they start to look like broadcasters, will some of the rules, such as must carry, local content rules, think of France, l'exception culturelle, must have our French content, and uh, you know, advertising rule, that sort of thing, will it start to apply? Um, come on. Um, and uh, uh, what will regulators do if consumers can't get an unbundled offer. So you go, again, you go to the v BT website and any offer, it always tells you free sports premium pack with that. Well, um, of course it isn't really free. I mean, that, that would be silly because BT got to make its money back somehow. So the word free is being used in English language when it really means included in the price. So, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, so will, as, as, as a result, will, will there be a bit of a rebellion and will, will people say, well, actually, no, please, I like, I just like my uh, naked broadband, for want of a better word. And is it important? Yes, be because BT has such a significant market share. So, Last, I just wanted to also point to something which we don't quite know how this will pan out. I am represented here by a can of worms, and that is uh, what the EU is doing on finally getting around to looking at uh, implementing the uh, single market directives uh, into the area of uh, content digital services and so on and so forth. What does it mean? Uh, we don't quite know, but uh, clearly increasingly, uh, you know, people want their contract truly anywhere. Uh, sadly, if you have that TV Anywhere app, you subscribe to this expensive service, you have your TV Anywhere app, and uh, you go abroad and you want to watch that cricket match, and guess what, you can't because uh, of geo-blocking. So that, that is the other big uh, can of worms uh, and various other things that might affect uh, media rights and how companies deal with customers in future. So that brings me, oops, I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, so <coughs> bundling of access and content can deliver great benefits to the operator, uh, especially if there's some exclusivity. But if you start to become really successful, the risk of regulatory intervention increases uh, and uh, so as a result, I think that bundling strategies with regards to exclusive content may not be so sustainable in the long term. Thank you very much. <laughs>